I said, what if one bishop proposed to all the bishops that before it goes to the Pope, they send it out, the, the voting, the questions, they send it out to every bishop in the world, asking them to vote by post. And do you know why that would be so significant? Because finally it would be an act of the entire college. And even a Pope has to listen to that. And it would be the beginning of, of a change. Uh, and from which I, you know, one could hope that many other things could follow. But, I mean, I'll be saying this in a few talks this year, the Pope doesn't want that. And the, the case of the ordination of women is the proof of it. See, I don't know, you may know this already, but what happened back there in the mid-90s um, was there was all this agitation for the ordination of women. The Pope didn't want it, again, because it would question the, the authority of popes. So the issue was never the ordination of women. They didn't even get to it. It was the authority of the Pope. And instead what they did was write a document. And then the Pope wanted to give it authority. So what he did was invite to Rome the presidents of the bishops' conferences. Just the presidents. And when they got there, they were presented with this document and they were asked to endorse it in the name of all the bishops. And they said, thank God, we can't. Uh, because we haven't, you know, we can't speak for all the bishops. The good thing, of course, they all had to go home. <laughs> and if they had to come home and said, well, we endorsed it in your name, there would have been, you know, big problem, so they would not do it. Instead, they asked that two phrases be, be omitted. One was, auditis fratribus, you know, having heard our brothers in the Episcopal. Mm -hmm. They asked that that be deleted, they said, because you haven't. And then they also asked that the word irreformabilis, irreformable, uh -huh. be omitted. Not quite infallible, but, you know, virtually the same mm -hmm. thing. They asked that that be omitted. So, what did the Pope do? He published the document with those words omitted. And then, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, who happened to be one Josef Ratzinger, uh -huh. then wrote a, a document saying that it really was infallible already. And he quoted, particularly, the unanimous support of all the bishops over 2,000 years. But can you see what that was? Those bishops had never been asked. And besides which, they were all dead, and so they couldn't <laughs> speak now. Um, you know, as you would know, most of those bishops in the past 2,000 years would have voted against the ordination of women over those 2,000 years. But their reasons would have been all, all sorts of reasons, cultural uh, in many societies, but also, you know, the attitudes of many people of the past, as you, as you would well know, when you start reading some of the fathers of the church, mm -hmm. you find some of their statements about women, you know, are horrendous. And, and so it's no, it's hardly any surprise that they didn't, wouldn't have really been in favor of the ordination of women. But, you know, to, uh, to appeal to the dead po uh, bishops and not even ask the living ones, <laughs> it, you know, it is a joke. And it was, I felt, it was, a, it was the death of collegiality. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the Pope can put out an infallible statement without even asking the bishops, then infallibly, and sorry, then collegiality has no meaning whatsoever. And I felt that day was the, the death of collegiality. But then thinking further, it occurred to me, no, the Pope couldn't ask the bishops. And you know why? because he couldn't guarantee that they would all support this ban on the ordination of women. And now, I don't know, I, I believe a majority would have supported him, mm -hmm. but it would not have been all. I don't know how many would have opposed, but the whole point is the Pope didn't know either. And let's imagine, let's imagine 
that it had been two-thirds in favour and one-third against. How could the Pope put that out and say, here's an infallible teaching? The Catholic world would have said, excuse me, Catholic teaching and one in every three of your own bishops doesn't agree with it? And that would be, that would look ridiculous, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it was three quarters uh, would have voted for it. Maybe it was 80%. But if you've still got any sort of percentage on top who don't agree, how can you possibly call it infallible? To, get, to, to, to call it infallible, you'd need a minimum, it seems to me, of what, 95%? Before you can call it infallible. Mm -hmm. And I think the Pope knew he wasn't going to get that. So he wasn't going to ask. And I think that's in all these questions, he's not going to ask the bishops because he can't guarantee their answer. You know, changing sexual morality. No, he can't guarantee their answer. Too many would say, you know, agree with what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. you know, it's much better to base this on persons and relationships rather than on the physical act. Um, you know, I think a lot of bishops... I, look, I'll tell you something. Um, we once had a meeting of... Uh, or it was about 15, perhaps, maybe 15 up to 20, something like that, bishops from Australia and New Zealand. And, and I asked a question or two about sexual morality. Things like, uh, do you still believe that... Uh, Every sexual sin is a mortal sin, such that even taking pleasure in thinking about sex for two seconds is a mortal sin. Now, two, two of them just kept quiet and didn't say a word. But the other 15 or so said, no, we don't believe that. Which is a, not a bad indication that if the Pope actually asked the bishops some questions about sexual morality, You'd get large, you know, particularly once you started getting into things like that, you know, the questions I just asked. Do you believe every mortal sin is, every sexual sin is mortal? Do you believe even thinking about it for two seconds is a mortal sin? Uh, they'd say no. And then at that point, the whole sort of sexual morality would be in, in debate, would be up for question. You'd have to pull back it, and that would mean popes were wrong. And that's what can't happen. So you, you see why I, I now, in my thinking, think that everything comes back to papal authority. That's why Pope Paul VI decided the way he did in uh, Humane Vitae, on contraception. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the argument, the ultimate argument is the popes can't be wrong. Uh, at the popes, you know, 2,000 years of popes can't be wrong. Therefore, we can't change on contraception, we can't change on celibacy, we can't change on sexual morality, we can't change on ordination of women, etc. And it's to such an extent that the actual issues are not even considered. No one, for example, on contraception, no one talks about contraception in itself any longer. Catholic people have made up their own minds. Bishops have made up their own minds. And the only question, if you ever raise it, you're straight back to papal authority. This is why I, you know, I insisted that it's got to be power and sex where we need the changes. And I do believe they are a significant contributors to the whole sexual abuse issue. Uh, I believe that that teaching on sex is positively unhealthy and yet a lot of the priest offenders grew up under that. Um, and when you've got, you know, something as unhealthy as all of that, that's not going to lead to a mature sexuality. And I think it was a contributing factor to the fact, I mean, I've, I've met people not, who, who, who have effectively said to themselves, some young people, you, you can't live up to that. You can't follow all that teaching exactly as it is. Um, so you might as well. Yeah.
anyway, this is the way I'm thinking on a lot of these subjects. It, it, it does all come back to that papal authority and that prison of the past. We, 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 we've got to admit that we can be wrong on most things, mm -hmm. on everything almost. Um, it, it, it's just part of life. And it's a terrible, terrible, impossible bind to get into to say, no, on these matters the Pope can't be, that can't be wrong. That's where you get this creeping infallibility. <laughs> I like that expression. Yes, it is, but it's so true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the issue is not the formal bits of infallibility. The, in, the, the real issue is how much papal prestige has been invested in a particular teaching. So that even the celibacy of priests, it's, it's, you know it's a law, it's not a solemn teaching, it's only a law. But there's been so much papal prestige put into it that there can't be change. It's the celibacy that, you know, a priest wakes up a year or two after his ordination and, and finds that the celibacy is unwanted, unaccepted and unassimilated. And then that's dangerous. It can lead to a lot of different problems, one of which is, is the problem of abuse. <laughs>